Doctor, thank you very much for doing this. Pleasure. Call me Harold. Tell me about yourself. Let's start life story. Well, I was uh, born at the beginning of World War II. Um, my parents were the children of immigrants. I went to public schools in Freeport, New York, a modest bedroom community, not far from New York City. Grew up in a pretty conventional way. Probably after my sophomore year in high school, I was exposed to kids who were more ambitious than I was when I went to the Putney School Work Camp, and that had a pivotal effect on me, made me realize that there was more to life than growing up as a comfortable son of a physician on Long Island and uh, went off to Amherst College thinking I would probably stick to my pre-med ambitions, but got interested in philosophy and majored in literature, did a thesis on Charles Dickens that I'm still proud of. I ended up going to graduate school in literature. After about a year there, I realized my friends who had gone to medical school were having more fun than I was. What was it about science that eventually weaned you away from this principal interest in literature and philosophy? I had always thought about myself as possibly being a doctor. I admired what my father did. I remember Gertrude Stein saying, I went to medical school because it opens all doors. I switched after my first year and went to medical school at Columbia. I enjoyed medical school, unlike most people. I was thinking seriously about biology for the first time. First glimmers of molecular biology being important and the practice of medicine were on the horizon. I could see that there was a lot to be learned by understanding more profoundly how cells worked and how genes inform cells. Remember this, though it seemed like we were pretty far along in, in the world of molecular biology at that time. In fact, we were at the very nascence of double helix that had only been discovered 10 years before. Speaking now about the early 60s. What years, early 60s. Yeah. yeah, given that it was the Vietnam era, many uh, young physicians were not strong supporters of the war. I was actually a very active opponent of the war. We were all required to do national service of some kind. Either you go into the army or join the public health service, or you go to jail or leave the country. So there weren't that many choices available for someone like me. Uh, and I was fortunate as someone who had basically learned some medicine but had done no serious science to get uh, an assignment at uh, the, the NIH, National Institutes of Health. And that was probably the critical moment in the development of my career because up until that point, the closest I came to thinking of myself as a scientist was to say, I'm really fascinated by what science is teaching us about medicine but I had no idea that I could actually do science. Whenever I had tried you know, recapitulating ancient experiments in a, in a classroom laboratory, I either failed or was miserable doing it. Um, but suddenly I saw that uh, if you were devising your own experiments and trying to answer the next question instead of what people have learned in the past, that science was actually an incredibly stimulating activity. I learned the joy of telling other people about your results, about going to meetings and showing off getting together and with like-minded scientists and thinking about uh, how you solve a problem that seems ineluctable but uh, actually is approachable if you have the right tool. And I, I had an epiphany one Saturday morning when I put things into what we, a kind of sophisticated Geiger counter and could see that I could actually measure how one gene gets copied into RNA to make protein. Sort of a eureka moment for you? It is. I mean, I wasn't answering a question. I just had the tool. I had the, I had the measuring stick. There were a lot of questions I could answer that depended on trying to understand a basic problem in biology, gene regulation. You know, we come into life as human beings with roughly 21,000 genes. Each of our cells expresses, makes the protein encoded by a different constellation of those 21,000 genes. How does the cell know how to do that? So now you're hooked on science. Absolutely. At age 28, you make this switch. In your world, that's pretty late on. It is pretty late. On the other hand, it's a chronology that I like to point out to other people because I increasingly see these days that very ambitious and talented high school students, they think if I don't start working in a lab when they're 16 and start publishing in Nature when they're 18, that they're behind the others. And I, I say, slow down, prolonged adolescence, enriches your life, enriches the way you do science, and it doesn't need to be done so fast. Well, it didn't turn out all that badly. You won the Nobel Prize. 
Yeah, that's not why we were doing the work, though. I think that's, I think that's an important thing to state. Uh, I mean, and I want to fall. follow up on that, because yeah. so many people, a lot of powerful people included, who are organized around the idea that people should be doing scientific research with a goal of producing a better product, as opposed to just learning for learning's sake and knowledge for knowledge's sake. No one does that kind of work oblivious to the possibilities. Even then, you couldn't write a grant application without saying, you know, how this might be useful. And I was certainly aware that if we understood the molecular basis of cancer, we might do a better job in diagnosing it and preventing it and treating it. But I didn't myself want to develop the drugs that might be useful someday uh, in trying to defeat this disease. I, I hope somebody would do that. But uh, I think all of us grow up in an, an environment, whether consciously or not, in which we understand the the original precepts of Vannevar Bush, who wrote the book Science, The Endless Frontier, for Franklin Roosevelt after Vannevar Bush had served as the coordinator for all science during World War II. He said, let's give federal money to academic institutions and encourage them to study anything that looks interesting and approachable, and they will generate basic knowledge that industry will then come along and develop practical products. My concern is there's a lot of fundamental biology that we still don't understand. We've worked with a very restricted number of organisms. We have a set view about how life works that is clearly incomplete. You know, every year or two, there's some astounding discovery, whether it's the CRISPR editing tools or some new phenomenon about gene expression, that completely unexpected. And if we don't take chances, conservatism in this field seeps in and people begin to think more about their careers, the safe options, and not the risky ones. Uh, I have to say, things were so comfortable for people of, of my generation, I never really worried, am I going to get a job or get a grant? I just the question is, am I going to do good work? Well, I want to talk about the Nobel Prize. Tell me exactly, for what did you win the prize? What I wanted to do was learn something about the origins of cancer. and. Uh, not much was known about how a normal cell becomes a cancer cell. There was good reason to believe genetics was important. We have to put ourselves back into a historical era. We didn't have recombinant DNA technology. We didn't know how to do DNA sequencing. And the only game in town seemed to be a game that was played with viruses of various animals that could change a normal cell into a cancer cell quite efficiently so that was the game I wanted to play. How does a cell maintain its identity and not become a cancer cell? And what are the things that a virus brings into a cell that allows it to change the behavior of the cell so profoundly? So the prize was awarded because we had discovered that the cancer gene of a chicken virus called the Rouse sarcoma virus was derived from a normal cellular gene. Michael Bishop and Harold Varmus your discoveries started to give a new insight into the very complex disease that we call cancer. The fortunate thing is that we chose a virus that had a single gene that was able to turn a normal chicken cell into a cancer cell, and that gene wasn't required for the virus to grow. It was just an independent gene that must have come from somewhere. And understanding the nature of those changes and finding that there were lots of other viruses of a similar type that had other kinds of genes set in motion a kind of uh, avalanche of discovery of, of genes that to this day are targets of new cancer therapies and, and in some cases ought to be the targets for therapy, but we still haven't solved the problem of how to inhibit them. Well, it was landmark work for research into cancer. Where are we now in the continuing battle against cancer? Every cancer has its own genetic signature. One of the great mysteries of cancer, one of the reasons cancer is so fundamentally interesting, is that cancer is the result of evolutionary processes. Cells undergo genetic change, mutation, and the fittest cells survive and grow and spread to distant organs. And even after you begin to treat those cancers, it's generating more variants that are likely to demonstrate their fitness in the presence of an inhibitory drug because cancer is such a wily beast. You're very prolific as an author. What do you see as the biggest problem of, I'll use the verb, translating science 
to the general public. Yeah, well, there are some big problems here. In my view, you can't transmit all of scientific knowledge to anybody. I'm sometimes reminded when I run into the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and she was my congressman about 30 years ago, who still remembers the day I brought a young energetic scientist from UC San Francisco to see her. The scientist's name was Cynthia Kenyon. She's made some important discoveries about aging and small roundworms. And she came into Pelosi's office and she didn't try to inundate her with information. She was just able to transmit the excitement of using the genetics of these small worms to understand lifespan. And everybody's interested in lifespan. So it was her enthusiasm, her passion, much more than just the details of exactly the what information. She did. What Nancy Pelosi remembers to this day is the excitement. I think you also have to contextualize the goal in science communication. Many times you are trying to teach someone something and the content matters a lot. Other times you're simply trying to persuade someone that, that science is an exciting enterprise and in the case of a member of Congress, that they ought to support it with, with federal funds. So then it become, there's a pragmatic outcome, but it's not learning uh, why a worm becomes uh, an old worm. You've had any number of positions that brought you into politics. What does your experience dealing in politics tell you? I have found myself trying to be sure that the products of science, the knowledge we generate, is widely and efficiently shared. The tools are now available. You know you want to use the internet to foster dissemination of knowledge, and that's the way I and many other scientists feel, that there is no fundamental reason why it's not possible for every paper, even before it's been peer-reviewed, to be accessible to a broad public without inhibitions of the kind that are created by, by subscriptions. Subscription-based journals should be done by now. They will be done soon, I think, but uh, we haven't quite gotten to that stage. Doesn't mean there's no cost to publication, but uh, we need to find the resources in other ways. Funding organizations want the, the products of the labors their money pays for to be made widely available. So other scientists, uh, people who are worried about a disease, people who are just curious about something, have access to the information. And we have the tools to do that now, and yet it's been 20 years of uh, fairly uh, heated political battles to try to get us part of the way. Well, you've been a leader in that. Well, I've worked on Making it, yeah. much more accessible. What should we, the people, what should we be doing about communicating science? I would love to see uh, more emphasis on scientific communication as a kind of, as a, as a discipline in its own right. What you have to learn to do is to focus on something that somebody cares about. Why don't we have an influenza vaccine? A good one. Uh, Good question. I don't know the answer. Well, uh, some of the answers are kind of pat, also true, uh, that the, va the virus changes every year. But I think if you start by saying to someone, you know, here's, here's something, you know, we, we've known about influenza. My, my grandmother died in the influenza epidemic 100 years ago, 1918, 101 years ago. How come? We know a lot about influenza virus. Why don't we have a good That's vaccine? Question. Uh, and uh, you start with that question, and then suddenly you're talking about virology and protein structure and how the immune system works and uh, how these viruses mate because they exchange information all the time, makes, they create new viruses every year. Uh, you get someone led into an incredibly interesting discussion that requires a fair amount of knowledge that you could not simply feed to them by saying, today we're gonna talk about how influenza viruses mate. But if you bring people in by asking a question that's very provocative, then you make some progress. And I think we need to get people attuned to how to do that. Doctor, thank you very yeah. much. I really appreciate your thank time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's fun. Thank you.